Technology is changing the way we live. It is also changing our health. The first full human DNA cost almost $3 billion. Now we get our own personal knockoffs for a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> this has opened up huge opportunities for our health. Our own St. Paul's Hospital is a leader in this pursuit, and our next guest is exploring ways to harness this technology and make our lives healthier. Please welcome Dr. Liam Runham. Many of you will know that heart disease, cancer, chronic lung diseases are some of the leading causes of death throughout the world. But what you may not realize is that adverse drug reactions, side effects from medications, are the fourth leading cause of death in many countries, including the United States and Canada. And how can this be that the very drugs that we use to treat our patients are killing us? Well, there's incredible variability in how people respond to medications. Some people have the desired effect, some people will have no effect, and some people will actually be harmed. We know some of the reasons for this variability, and in fact, we use some of these in our practice. So I might prescribe a different dose of a medication depending on a patient's weight, their age, their kidney function. But in fact, a huge part of the variability is due to genetic differences, how our DNA is different from each other. And currently, this is not used at all in our prescribing of medications. And how medicine uses knowledge of differences in our genomes to make our drugs safer and more effective is one of the greatest challenges for medicine in the next 10 years. I'm going to tell you one short story over the next few minutes about some of the work we are doing to try to use knowledge of patients' DNA to make our medications safer. To do this, I'm going to have to teach you a little bit of biology, so bear with me. This is something called the Waddington landscape, and this has been the dominant view of the development of organisms for many, many years. And the concept here is that the development of an organism is like a marble rolling down a hill. It starts off at the top with many possibilities, but as it goes down, those possibilities become fewer. And as it gets to the bottom, it becomes more specialized. So a cell that starts at the top with, with uh, an incredible array of options to it becomes specialized and become a cell of the heart or a cell of the kidney or a cell of the brain. And the key thing is that the marbles only go in one direction. They roll down, but they can never go back up the hill. Well, this dogma was shattered in 2006 when a brilliant Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, showed that by incorporating just four genes into a specialized cell, it could actually be nudged back up Waddington's Hill, back to the top, where it would again have infinite possibilities in terms of what it could become, something that we call an induced pluripotent stem cell. So how do we use this technology in the lab? Well, we can take a blood sample from the patient, isolate cells from the blood, and by exposing them to those Yamanaka factors, those four genes, we can turn them into these induced pluripotent stem cells. And these cells have two very profound properties. One is that they're renewable. They can be grown essentially indefinitely in the lab. And secondly, they can be differentiated into any of the specialized cells of the body. So we can coax these stem cells to become a cell type that we like. For instance, a specialized cell of the heart, a cardiomyocyte. And when we do this in the lab, and look at these cells, they take on some very interesting characteristics. So these cells start to spontaneously beat and contract, just like the heart does, telling us that these cells actually possess many of the key features of heart cells in our own body. I'm going to tell you about one experiment that we've done using this technology. Here we've compared cases. These are patients that were treated with a medication and experienced a side effect from that medication. In this case, a chemotherapeutic drug that caused damage to their heart. We compared these patients to controls, patients that received the same medication but tolerated it and did not have the side effect. From both the cases and controls, we isolated blood cells and turned them into these induced pluripotent stem cells. We then turned those cells into specialized heart cells. We treated them with the drug, and we compared how they responded. And what we found was very remarkable. The cases, the patients that had suffered the toxicity from this drug, were far more sensitive to the effects of the drug looking at heart cells that we had generated from their own blood. And what this tells us is actually very profound. It tells us that had we done this experiment 
before the patients had received their chemotherapy, chemotherapy, we could have predicted with a high degree of accuracy whether they would have gone on to become a case, in other words, have been harmed by the drug, or whether they would have been a control and have tolerated the effect of the medication safely. And so this suggests to us an entirely new paradigm in terms of how we can treat our patients in the future. And the concept is this. Currently, if you have a condition that needs treatment with a drug, say drug X, our current practice is that we give you the drug and essentially we hope for the best. <laughs> we tell you you might have a side effect, but we have no ability to predict whether you will be a patient who suffers from a side effect or whether you will tolerate that medication. But in the future, what we feel is that before exposing a patient to a potentially harmful medication, we could isolate these induced pluripotent stem cells from the patient's blood. We could then turn those stem cells in the lab into the cell type of interest. So if it's a drug that may harm the liver, we could turn it into a liver cell. If it's a drug that may harm the brain, we could turn it into a neuron, and so on. We could then treat the cells with drug X and predict how the patient might respond. If our results from the lab tell us that the patient would tolerate that medication safely, then it could be safely prescribed. If, on the other hand, our results predicted that the patient might be harmed from that medication, then we could use an alternate medication, a lower dose, or take other strategies to try to prevent that toxicity. Using this type of approach, we believe that in the future, we'll be able to choose the right drug at the right dose for the right patient. In my work, I'm very privileged to work with many incredible individuals, and I've just listed a few of the students in my laboratory at the Center for Heart Lung Innovation, colleagues from UBC and Simon Fraser University, and the organizations that make our work possible. Thank you very much.